Cloud at Autoscout. With me is uh, Wolf Schlegel, coding architect from ThoughtWorks. And Christian Deger, also coding architect from Autoscout. And we have an agenda today. I will briefly introduce Autoscout, what's the business model behind it and what we are actually doing. And then... And next we learn a few things about why this is all happening, what we are talking about. And then we tell you a little bit how we are building our services, how the principles behind those uh, work. And last but not least, we look at the people side of things, because it's not all about technology, but change implies change to people. It's important to understand that and kind of how to deal with that. Okay, this is a big overview how I believe Autoscout works. The, the corner piece of, of Autoscout is we are in the listings business. So you can place an ad for a used vehicle on our platform and other people can find those and, and try to buy those cars. So in the end we have the classifieds, this is what we call the, the ads that are placed on our platform. And there is dealers pay us to place ads on our platform Private sellers can freely place ads there. And in bold are the parts we are currently building within our project. This is then what we call the search funnel. Uh, this is where consumers can search for classifieds, uh, get in, in contact with the dealer and all that stuff. And what's interesting about that is that we have a site that is producing classifieds and we have a site that is consuming those classifieds to be displayed. What did Autoscout look like about a year ago and is still behind the scenes most of what you can actually see on the platform? So we have a, a very good delivery engine. So we have, we have data centers, we have all the agile and lean principles in place, we have a good team spirit, um, but this is still mostly from, from an infrastructure side, an enterprise setup. So we have big clusters of VMware sitting around and everything in there is optimized for the mean time between failure. So this, all the stuff got redundant, uh, power supplies, nothing should break. There's, this is how it rolls. So this is an enterprise setup and actually not a web setup. And more important also is that everything we do up until the last year was Microsoft.net. So this is our baseline and worked quite well for us. But then, but then something changed. Uh, in the end of 2013, Auto Scout and the whole Scout group was partly sold from Telecom and a new CEO came on board. And he asked questions. Are you ready for the future? Is this really a 21st century company? Yes, we are. Everything is, is great. But then he asked another question. Do you attract talent? And of course we do. Uh, we're a good employer. But especially around Munich, when, when talking about .NET, who is building software in .NET, by the way? Ah, so <laughs> cool. So in, in, in Munich, in, in .NET, we mainly got uh, developers from an enterprise background, from insurances, from banks, and not web developers. So there were good developers, but we need to teach them the web and we need to teach them the way we work. And when we then looked at other companies, a lot of the influencers in the web technology space nowadays uh, are not the big vendors anymore, like in previous times, Microsoft, Oracle, stuff like that, but the big web companies, Google, Netflix, Amazon, those are influencing our, our industry. And what we see there is that the JVM ecosystem in comparison with the .NET ecosystem is way bigger. The, what we call the flywheel. So there is technology, excitement, and community in this ecosystem. And this is also true for the .NET ecosystem. But the JVM ecosystem is way bigger, and we get more webby developers in there that bring new ideas to the table, which in the .NET, .NET ecosystem are a little bit lagging. And after we learned that, we started a project. And the project is called Tatsu. It's the name of a Japanese dragon. 
and stands for fly at the speed of fear. And the roller coaster you have just seen before we started is named after Tatsu. And sometimes what we're doing feels like being on that roller coaster. So we've got five challenges or five key tasks we are dealing with. So the first one is we are coming from a monolithic architecture and we want to cut down the monolith and build microservices out of that. Second one is a technology change where from data center, from own data centers by, um, run by Autoscout, we move into the cloud. And in particular, we chose AWS as a cloud. Another technology change is moving on from .NET to JVM-based languages and Linux as operating system behind that. Right now, we're using Scala as JVM language, but it could be any other language as well. Then come two more changes or two more key challenges, and they are related to people and how people work, and they are the most important ones. So in the old days, we had developers sitting over there, cutting codes, developing stuff, we have operations sitting over there, running stuff in the data centers. And we move on to a DevOps model, which is the, the trendy, probably no longer trendy name. We like to call it, you build it, you run it. So we have teams who are building products, and that implies business people are in the teams as well, but the teams are also running the, the services. So services are owned by teams, and developers get the pages, and they need to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning if things go wrong, and no longer ops people in a different department. Last but not least, this started as an IT initiative, and there's always a risk that when you start such a large transformation driven by IT that business people get lost. So we need to take great care that we do not lose the, the product people behind. The technical transformation looks roughly like that. That's the master plan. So we take the monolith and we see some smaller siblings next to the monolith, kind of from early attempts to carve it up. And we take out vertical slices. And this is important, the slices are self-contained. So we take out one slice, one product, or maybe perhaps to we'll start with one feature, build the respective services. And as you see here, a slice may result in multiple services, and then we just repeat. And we do so until the um, left-hand side is finished, it's no longer there. We need to do all this while the car is running full speed. So this is easy, what these people are doing there. They are cheating because they have a pit stop. So the car stops to be refueled or to change the wheels. We need to keep the cache stack, the monolith, the existing application running because this is what is serving the majority of the website today and this is what is earning the money. So, as Wolf already mentioned, we intended to change a lot of things. And when you change a lot of things, you need something to hold on to, which guides you through, through all those changes. And we came up with a set of principles that works towards the strategic goals why we're actually doing that. And this is for reference only. This, these are our strategic goals and our architectural principles and, uh, and delivery principles. They work very well for us, but uh, be advised, don't just use them for you. You have a different culture, you have different projects. These are ours. Come up with your own, have discussions around them. This, this kind of, of high-level discussion is very valuable. It guides you when you make, need to make decisions, it aligns the culture within the teams, and this is also evolving. There are few pieces on there which are changing due to Scout moving closer together, there's uh, another strategic goals appearing on, the, on, on, on this chart. And actually we have this printed out in every team room, there, there's a paper on it and we get feedback on those principles, others understood, do we live by it, this works quite well. Now we look a little bit deeper into some of them, we won't go through all of them. The first principle we want to highlight is organized around business capabilities. What it means is that our teams should build products and not projects. They should live within something that by itself delivers value and 
um, respect the boundary of the domain, so don't have layer teams for the back end, for the front end, have teams that are organized around a capability within your business. As you have seen on the, on the, on the first slide, there is the search funnel. So we have teams that are working on the search funnel and they're working on that business capability. And this goes also back to bounded context and, and domain-driven design. So the next one we briefly touched upon already. You built it, you run it. And actually, this is incomplete. The, the full sentence reads, you invent it, you built it, you run it. So a team contains product owners defining and designing the products, coming up with ideas team building stuff, cutting code, and operating stuff. And what's behind that is you get very fast feedback, both from a product viewpoint, but also from a technical viewpoint. So you don't have ops people running stuff and kind of the next day you realize, oh, something went wrong. And this, this is really, um, it's, it's quite interesting. So the, the, the current model is a team may own multiple services, and there is a notion of kind of purpose-driven teams, which is orthogonal to that one, which is you, people get together, build something, and disband, which doesn't work well for the notion of owning services. So we are going to experiment with that in the future, but today it is you build it, you run it. Yes, and this could, on, the, on, the, on the first slide we had, uh, or not on the first, on the last slide was, one of our strategic goals is time to market, and you build it, you run it, is a good way to have fast feedback on what you're doing within the team. And another principle which, is, which needs explanation is be bold. What do we mean by that? Uh, Facebook had a, a, a value slash principle, uh, be fast and break things, uh, which didn't went too good for them because new developers joining Facebook tried to break stuff. Um, they <laughs> changed it a little bit. But in the essence, what do we want to be? We want to be fast. We don't want to have all the security nets in, in place that, that a bank or insurance company might need to have in place. We want to be fast, and this needs, for this we need to, to be bold. Examples of that would be that we don't have a staging environment. We have a dev environment where we are developing, and then we have the production environment. There is no staging in between. So we are being bold by going into production directly. We are not being stupid. There, we have safeguards in place, which we can can talk about. Same goes, we are optimizing for mean time to failure, uh, not, no, we are optimizing for uh, mean time to recovery and not for mean time between failure. So our services are um, built in a resilient way so that the individual service could fail and the whole thing just keeps on working. Right. So we do do architecture and we do architecture at two different levels. So it's very important to us that teams are autonomous. We always say they should be fast. So they need to be empowered to be fast. So we make a distinction between macro architecture and micro architecture. So macro architecture is things that are um, mandatory for all the teams, things that are not negotiable. So this in our example, this is we go AWS. So all the services you build are in the cloud and in AWS in particular, you couldn't use, choose a different cloud, for example. Or rules around or guidelines around security, they are binding for all the teams. But other than that, when a team builds a service, microarchitecture applies. And here microarchitecture says use a JVM language but which language to use and which libraries and which kind of particular technologies is up to the team. Yes, and the last one on the slide is shared nothing, but I won't say anything to shared nothing because we will go deeper into that right now. Yeah, that's the next topic. And so sharing, the share, we start by looking at shared infrastructure. And what's the thing about sharing? So if you share things, they may make you more efficient because you don't reinvent wheels. On the other hand side, sharing implies dependencies and dependencies slow you down. So we started from the point where we say share nothing, otherwise teams cannot be autonomous. And then questions kick in like, oh, what about availability? Availability is quite important. So what's more important, sharing nothing or guaranteeing availability? So if you find good reasons to share, we do share, and to um, continue the example around availability, 
what we derive from that, availability is really, really important. We need to have a common approach to logging. So we create log events and we can analyze those log events via um, a shared ELK stack. And this helps all the teams when things go wrong to get it right again and to fix stuff. So here, yeah, this is where we say, well, this has become macro architecture. You all have to lock your events in this particular style to ensure availability. Then we have convenience offerings, like we've got a large um, delivery pipeline and it's built on, on Go CD. And, but this is a convenience offering, so a team may decide to um, choose a different technology, build up their own pipeline, that's, that's up to the team. And one thing we learned, um, kind of hard, it's really important when sharing things not to have any side effects. We have dashboards in the teams and initially they were shared and teams were kind of reporting wrong numbers or bogus figures to each other, so that was, that taught us don't, um, don't share these things, but keep them separate. Um, to summarize, fast local decisions are really important to us. We don't have committees, we don't have the enterprise, IT, architecture, ivory tower coming up with the macro architecture. Later on, Christian is going to tell us how we do macro architecture. And last but not least, um, Autoscout is one member of the larger Scout 24 family. There is a sister business, Immobilien Scout, looking into real estate, also classified for real estate, and we exchange experiences between those two businesses to see where can we learn. Next, I would like to show you a few examples how we share things and how we do not share things. The first one is how many environments do we have? And the question behind that is do we need a staging environment? And if teams build services, when do these services integrate for the first time? And we decided, as Crystal mentioned, not to have staging, but we have two environments. One is dev, one is prod. And the interesting bit is services integrate for the first time on prod. They do not integrate on dev. That may sound a bit scary, but we've got two things that are helping us out here. First, if we deploy a service on prod, um, AWS provides you with kind of tooling around um, auto-scaling and up, not auto-scaling, around updating um, versions of services. And if updates go wrong, AWS load balancers would, notif would notice, oh, this, this node I just spun up is not working, so I just keep everything as it was before. That's, that's helping us on the production side. Also, we use, we use feature toggles to kind of go shadow live and experiment with things in the production environment, but not expose it um, to end users. On dev, we use consumer-driven contracts, and that's the, the keyword to take away. Consumer-driven contracts and fakes, and so we built a chain of trust, if you like. If these tests are green, we are very confident that stuff will work out um, on production. Then, actually, we had quite some debate around shared nothing. Christian showed the, the principles before, and when we spin up new teams, some team members come from a world where they say, no, hang on, it's good to build shared libraries, it's really, really useful, and we, we debate, what, are we no longer allowed to do this? So we thought about a few guidelines around that one. If we come to the point where we want to share a library, say, use it before you reuse it. So just, just learn how it feels, and then it should be hardened. So you should kind of come across all the, the, the teething problems and understand, oh yes, this is to, these are ways to make it better. And we've got a very simple kind of pecking order of sharing, and, and the first one may sound a bit scary. It's copy and paste. And this, again, was an outcry in some teams. What do you mean, copy and paste? We did that ages ago and learned never to do it. But we are talking about microservices, so it's a really small code base. And for example, to look up data from a DynamoDB table, we're talking about five classes and, I don't know, maybe less than 200 lines of code. And that's okay to copy and paste. And then in the teams, it, it evolves typically in different directions. And from that, we learn patterns. Um, how best to use it and understand is it really shareable and how could it be hardened. If then we decide yes, we want to share it, we would go um, open source. It could be internal open source or it could be open source um, open to the public. And then we may have a library. And then um, 
we have a pull model where we say, I want, if I want to change code of some other team, I just raise a pull request. So the, the code is owned by the team, not, not by everybody. Okay. Then to one of the services we are currently building. When talking about microservices, um, I assume there are two flavors out there, at least roughly speaking. The one is you have the microservice with an API, and then you have, you have some kind of composition layer uh, that is using all those back-end services to ten produce a web front-end or something like that. We don't like that. We try to build our services as vertical slices, built by autonomous teams, and within the service, the UI should be part of the service. So we are not building data services or just behavioral services. One of our services, or at least product capabilities, if it's com uh, composed of many services, should have its own UI so that the team is actually in charge of the whole value this product gives. And if you think about it, when one team also uses uh, builds the UI, I need a way to integrate those different UIs back so that from a user of Autoscout's websites, it's not visible that there are actually uh, individual teams building individual services behind the lines. This should look as one web page. So when, when reasoning about how to, how to do that, we actually referred back to our principles. So the first thing, shared nothing. This is Wolf already mentioned, this is one of our principles. We don't like to share stuff. And therefore, when thinking about how we do the front-end integration, we want to have a small thing in there without behavior. If this would be some kind of portal logic or a mini monolith as a web front-end before uh, our microservices, we would have built the next monolith, and we wouldn't like to do that. And the second part I already briefly mentioned is that we like our autonomous teams that are capable of building uh, products. And this leads us to that this kind of UI composition works like you have a page. This is typically then owned by the core product as is displayed on that page. And then you have other things that come in there that are composed together. This led us down this path. Another thing, this is Specific for Autoscout, we want to have one domain. When, when, when we initially started to modulize uh, our applications, we used subdomains because this was an easy thing to do, just put the burden on, on DNS queries of the, of the user and don't have an UI layer in there. So everything now in the new world is hidden behind one domain. And still, currently within Autoscout, there are teams working on making our web pages very, very fast. So Page speed is, is one of the things that is very important for us across all devices that are browsing those pages. And when introducing a composition part, then you need to make sure that you're not, not compromising your, your page speed. So the result of the rendered pages should still adhere to all the principles that are explained around page speed and, and website optimizations. So this is how it briefly looks like. We live in AWS with our project Tatsu. So in front of, we have the cloud front. Uh, this is uh, AWS CDN. And the default behavior for any request hitting cloud front is to actually go back to the data center. So all the behaviors that we don't have yet built on the new stack are just routed back to the data center and everything works. And for services that we have released on the new stack, it's then fed into Jigsaw, which is our UI composition layer. And Jigsaw then uh, knows which services to call by having those, those routes configured. So these are different microservices. This one could be the, the service responsible for displaying the detail page. This one could be responsible for, for displaying the header and footer. And Jigsaw would then use the detail page for a classified and make two requests to the header and footer service and, and just compose them together. This is what happens in, in the middle here. And 
when, when composing a page and fragments together and, and still live up to the page speed thing you tried before, and you also don't want to have a shared asset pipeline. You need to do something. Um, shared asset pipeline would mean that I, I would upfront at uh, build or delivery time know which assets, meaning CSS, JavaScript, and, and SVG graphics, need to be in place for the whole page to work. Uh, but now the whole page is composed of a page and fragments, so I need to somehow bring the assets from the fragment to the page. If you and all the approaches we have seen introduces a rather tight coupling which would completely violate our shared nothing principle. So what we are doing is that each fragment brings its own assets, being CSS or JavaScript, the page itself brings assets, and then there is a, as a clever trick in, trick in there. Our composition layer is built with Nginx. For Nginx, there is the Google Nginx PageSpeed module, and what the PageSpeed module does is then simply doing its thing and pulling the CSS in the right place where it's optimized for the page speed, it's combining it and also caching the result. So in essence, we now have a highly optimized page with the difference being the optimization is actually done at runtime. So we, we have the cost of, of doing that at runtime, but we have the advantage of loose coupling between pages and, and fragments. Okay, so next we're going to look a little bit of how we deal with classified data in, in, the, in the new world. And for that we looked into, we established two principles, if you like, or one principle and one recommendation. The first one is we like to have a one-way data highway. So you've got the, the cache stack, the existing application up and running right now. You've got the new world, the microservices up and running. And if you imagine the the first slide where Christian explained what Autoscout is doing at all. On the left-hand side, classifieds are being produced. They are written into a database right now. On the right-hand side, they are being consumed. So how do we get the information from left to right? And this is where we said we want to have a one-way one highway. So we do not allow microservices to call back to other services in the data center. And more explicitly, they are never ever allowed to kind of reach out to a database in the um, data center. The reason being, if you build the new services and allowing that, at some point in time, you say, hurrah, we are done. Everything is up and running in the new world. We can turn off the old world. But you've introduced all these dependencies, and chances are you can never turn off the old world. Second thing, we really like events. So when we came to the, when we came to the point where um, we transferred classified information into the first microservice, we thought about what if we do it event-based and not kind of state-based. Why do we like events? Events give you a very flexible data model. So e event means you create a classified and then you may change an attribute and that's as an update event, like the color is green, it's not bluish green, but it's green green, and then next you update the mileage or someone has asked a question. So you've got all these update events, and eventually you may delete a classified. And if, if you store all these events, you can deduce whichever state you want from that. You can deduce the current state by projecting all the events into the current state, or you can look at the historic state, at the history. So it gives us some flexibility. You may argue that this is kind of yagni and premature optimization, but it's, it's not much effort to put it in place, and we believe it's quite useful. So here, if you look at the technical evolution we did when creating the first event store, and we ended up with DynamoDB. And so I'm not going to walk through all of these, but there are um, a few key takeaways from here. One, this is happening in the cloud. So, and this was super, super fast. We experimented with those combinations in less than two weeks, and that meant writing code. Not just thinking very hard about it, but writing stuff. So, like, initially we said, surely we want to store events in S3, 
and how do we get the events into the cloud? Let's use some queuing mechanism. And then things changed. Then we said, hmm, what if we don't use SQS, which is the Amazon queuing service, but Amazon's um, streaming service, Kinesis. And then we said, hmm, S3 is not easy to query. What if we go for DynamoDB instead? And here we were unhappy with Kinesis, so back to SQS. And then we realized we actually have a queue, um, an effective queue in the data center, so we don't need that. And this is, this is my favorite. This is when a security person came around and said, now hang on, we've got this database thing, the DynamoDB table you are building, and we need to hide it behind a proxy. So it was kind of DMZ thinking. And this idea lasted for less than 24 hours, because next morning someone said, and so, hang on, DynamoDB is a global service. You don't deploy your own DynamoDB, but you use the global service provided by AWS. So you cannot, you cannot hide it, not at all. This is an example how you kind of need to think differently when building stuff in the cloud. But this was all super fast and a very enjoyable experience. So what came of this? Um, so we do have classifieds in the data center in an Oracle database, and we push them, obeying the one-way road, into a DynamoDB table. So here we have classified events, and they are just sitting there. So this classified service or classified event store is just providing classified data to any other service who's interested. And as an example, we've got a search service here, and events are forwarded or pushed to the search service. Here, for example, we have the classified detail, and originally we, th we thought, well, we would push classifieds here as well, or the classified events, project them into the current state of the classified, and cache, <coughs> sorry, cache the current state. And, but we realized we don't need caching because pulling classifieds and projecting them on demand was super, super fast, so we just built it that way. However, there is an elephant in the room when looking at this picture, and I would like you to spot the elephant. Any, taker, any takers for the elephant? <laughs> okay, this, this, is, this is data center, so this is going to disappear in the foreseeable future. A hint, the elephant is blue. Yeah. Yeah, so, so what, do, do you know why? Why is this elephantish? Getting close, getting close. So it, it feels like database integration. We've got different consumers, different services, and hang on, didn't, don't we want to get rid of the, the big database and now be back to integration? And so we thought about that and came across with a few answers. So we said, A, only one party is writing here, and all the other parties are effectively reading. So it's, it's the equivalent of an atom feed, for example. So, and it's a single table. It's not a huge... Um, relational model with many dependencies. So we are happy with that. But we thought a little bit more on and say, well, um, what about what coupling does it imply if we do those things? And we realized that we want to distinguish between two kinds of coupling. One is the payload, and the payload should be agnostic of DynamoDB, so that if and when needed, we can swap out DynamoDB as storage for the event. And the other coupling is the connectivity. So in the code, we've got lookups against DynamoDB. And we decided we need to observe the, the payload, be independent there, but we don't mind technical coupling in terms of connectivity because it's only a few lines of code and easily replaced. So another story. Uh, within Autoscout, we have a watch list. So if you're interested in a, in a vehicle and want to just compare it or keep it in, in your books, you just can star it and then it's on your watch list. So this could be a typical CRUD service. I add a classified to a watch list. I remove a classified from my watch list. And we started using DynamoDB just in that way. We had a document 
for each of our customer, he had a watch list, and there were all the entries in there, and we added and removed from this watch list. Uh, this worked reasonably well, but then we got some, some other insights that it's actually not a good idea. First, DynamoDB is uh, not a document database. They give you a JSON API on the SDK, but it's fooling you behind the scene. It's, it's not actually JSON that's, that's on the wire, and it does not behave like a document database. And it's proportionally, unproportionally more expensive to write to Dynamo than to read it. And the typical access pattern for a document to DB is when you want to change something, you read the whole document, change it, and write it completely back. So we switched to a model that is more based on events and also allows us to do different, to different things on the client. What we then did is we just stored all the events that were responsible for a watch list. So the add and the remove event was actually stored and not the resulting document. And on the client, we had a cache of the current representation of the watch list. In the web version, it was just simply local storage. And this now gave us a, a completely different model because now the watch list is available at the client even when it's not connected to the server. So I can make changes and I can actually tell what's on the watch list. And I can store those events uh, very well in the back end. Okay, so let's move on to the people side of things. So um, we mentioned we like the ability to run it teams and we made a few experiences here. And the first one is don't just set up your ability to run it and name it like that. You may fall it back into old behaviors. So you've got a Mandelbrot team, you know, these Mandel, Mandelbrot graphs where you zoom in and it just looks the same as before. And one example here is if you've got dev and ops in the old world separated, they get together as a team and you still see developers cutting code and the former ops people doing opsy things, you've fallen into the Mandelbrot trap. And one thing where we can measure that is if you've got an opsy task, are developers contributing to that one? And what happens if the ops person goes on holiday, goes on leave, if all this work suddenly stops? That's quite a smell. Next is the pager duty. So we get the pagers, we get up in the middle of the night, and that, that really needs getting used to. In the early days, we didn't know what to do about alerts. So we just started ignoring alerts, and so we ran into the broken window um, effect where, oh, it's broken, well, never mind, another one is broken, yeah, yeah. This one was broken before, don't care about it. And here we did some dry runs and trainings. We set up run books to help people understand in the middle of the night if this alert pops up, what needs to be done. And we experiment a little bit with part-time ops people in the team. So they were in the team for one week and then someone else would come in for the second week and then repeat that. That didn't work at all. There was loss of context and handover. And still, we respect that not all the people have the same T-shape. So the, they have kind of depths of knowledge in some area and some general knowledge across the other areas. And it's okay to respect that in the team as long as we don't fall into the other traps. And then we have the infrastructure guild. When talking about shared nothing, we also talked about trying not to have shared infrastructure and as few as possible. And we also don't want to have a infrastructure product or platform team. This is currently an experiment for us. Many other companies have those kind of teams. We currently do our infrastructure work within the product teams. So, for example, the team that is building the watch list is then also responsible for building parts of the logging infrastructure. And to actually organize the work that needs to be done, we have an infrastructure guild where those that are currently working on those infrastructure sh stories meet and discuss the status and, and the prioritization of, of infrastructure stories that needs to be done. And the actual work is done and then done by the teams themselves. This gives us the advantage that we don't have a disconnect from the, the stuff that's the software is running on and, and the people programming for it. And this also helps with the you build it, you run it motto because now the developers and engineers being devs and ops together know about their infrastructure and they have stakes in it and they can build the infrastructure needed for their product 
not use the infrastructure built by the infrastructure team with best of intentions. And Oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and this works quite well. Yes, go on. Okay, cool. Thank you. Sorry. So this is this is rough timeline how this project or rather program Tatsu evolved. So initially it was very kind of IT heavy. This is two months where we had spent 80% of the effort in understanding AWS, learning Scala and doing things like that. So the model is we ramp up teams. So teams come across. We started with one team. Sec next phase.